music only lasts for so long. So might as well dance while you still can. <laughs> This happened when I was a teenager, and I was living alone for the first time. About three or four months passed and things were going well. But then, one night, things changed. I got up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and I heard something. The knocking sound came from the front door. I had a video doorbell with an intercom. Didn't you see that? I wondered. It didn't even register that it might be weird that someone was knocking at the door so late. I guess I was a night owl back then. Still am to be honest. Anyway, without danger in mind, I casually bobbed over to the door and put my eye to the peephole. I looked, but there was no one out there. I didn't care. I just went back to bed. I forgot about the incident for a while because I started a new job working nights. Then, one night I just got back home from work. I took my shoes off by the front door and I heard a knock at the door. I quickly put my eye to the peephole. There was no one there. I opened the door. No one there. I thought it was a little creepy at this point, but I thought it could have been because I might have been making some sort of noise when I was returning home at night and a neighbor was knocking back in some sort of retaliation or protest. This weird knock at the door continued nightly. It made me feel pretty uncomfortable at night, so I called the building manager, and he said he would look into it. He said he thought that it could be kids playing a prank or something. He was decent about the situation, and even put up posters on the building to ward off cold callers. But the knocks... And the door didn't stop. I just got used to it in the end. I noted that the knocks seemed to occur at around 3.30 to 4am each night. It annoyed me that it was still an unsolved mystery though. So one night I decided to wait by the door from 3.10. I put my eye to the peephole to see if anyone would walk by. I must have been watching the intercom's live feed for about half an hour. I was so determined to find out who was doing this. I heard the knock at the door, and there was definitely no one there. The reason I couldn't see anyone on the intercom's video was because the knocking sound came from behind me this time. The balcony door. At that time, I thought it was a neighbor or some kid prank, but now it went up another level. It made my blood turn to ice. I didn't want to move. I couldn't afford to live anywhere else, so I just had to put up with it. Whenever I would wait by the front door, I would hear a knock on the balcony door. It seemed that the prank or whatever it was wouldn't go beyond a knock, so I didn't care so much. After a couple of years, an incident happened where a car plowed through my balcony doors. I lived on the ground floor and my apartment was in line with the car park outside. I guessed that some careless driver had forgotten to put the handbrake on or accidentally pulled forward into my apartment. I was livid, but I didn't have to deal with much of the admin, because by the time I came back the police and the landlord had already dealt with it. They had patched it up with plywood as best they could and told me that repairs would be ongoing from the next day. After all that, I needed a drink, so as I was sat in my chair, staring at the mess of my apartment, sipping on the cold beer, I laughed out loud and asked absent-mindedly, is everything going to be okay? I then heard a tap against the plywood, two knocks, but it wasn't the usual time for that kind of thing though. I smiled. It was the first time that I thought it could be something otherworldly making the knocking sound. Since that day, I loved hearing the knocks. It was a real sense of comfort. 
I don't want to go into detail, but as you might be able to guess, that when a teenager moves out, it's not usually for a good reason. I didn't have much of a support network around me, so coming home and saying stuff like, I'm home, and hearing a knock or a tap as if in response was really heartwarming. I am indebted to whoever chose to keep me company. We had five happy years together. The day before I moved out, I stood there in the empty apartment and asked aloud, is it okay if I leave? I heard two knocks come back, only slower than usual. I am not ashamed to say, I am not ashamed to say that I had tears in my eyes that day. I was probably 12 or 13 at the time and cycled the 8 kilometers to school every single morning. Most days, I had a group of my Catholic school buddies riding along, but I preferred the solitary moments pedaling through those quiet roads the most, and it still stands as my best memories of school times. There was a tiny underpass, large enough for one rickshaw at a time, that brought me to school quicker across the army cantonment area in Kirki, Pune. Often, as I zipped through the underpass, an aged lady I would spot sitting in the corner just after, a single bag of belongings by her side, brewing some tea in a little utensil set atop a little wood fire. It was the fourth time of coming across the lady, watching her little bag of food that I finally got the courage and heart to stop and talk to her. Namaste, Aji, I said, Aji being grandmother in the Marathi language. Do you live here, Aji? I see you sitting here every day as I pass. She looked up with myopic eyes and said, I live all around this place, and this is where I sit to brew my tea and eat some food. This is my home now, and has been my home ever since I left home. I didn't ask her why she left, and knelt next to her, watching the frail and delicate lady, in her pink sari, struggle to open the packet of dal and rice. Without thinking, I took out my lunch from the pack on my cycle, asked her for a plate if she had one, and placed more than half of my tiffin onto it. She looked at the food in disbelief and asked what I would eat throughout the day, and I told her that I had friends who were happy to share their food if need be, gave her the six one-rupee coins I had, and bade goodbye as I was getting late for school. And every single day after that, I would look for her at her usual spot, and for sure, there she was, preparing her tea, and after a quick chat and my tiffin on her plate, I would speed off to school before the entry gate shut for assembly. My pocket money of coins I would hand over without fail, never once thinking I would need it to buy some candy or snacks from the school canteen, though I would often miss binging on tamarind candy packets on some days. Some days, when I had more time, I would chat with her and tell her some stories from school and my playtime and she, in return, would hum a song or two as she ate the food. Soon it was school break, and I bade her goodbye for a month or two, and gave her around 200 rupees I had received during one of the festivals from my aunt. I hoped it would suffice for some food and her stock of tea in the weeks I couldn't meet her. She assured me of having shelter and a source of food available, and though uneasy, I bid her a see you soon. I often thought of her in holidays, but playing with friends soon distracted me. I did request a friend to cycle with me to the spot with some fruits and snacks, but she was nowhere to be seen. Soon school set in, and amidst the monsoon, I went through the usual route, but again she wasn't there, nor was seen for the next two weeks. I grew worried and increased my route on the way home, hoping to spot her sitting under a bus shelter or somewhere safer. 
I even asked about her to the cycle repair shop guy who filled air in the children's tires often and was just a kilometer ahead of Aji's spot. He hadn't spotted her all these days either. And finally, one sun-soaked morning, I found her at the same spot again, making her favorite tea. I stopped with a rush and shouted, Haji, where have you been all this time? I got food for you daily. She smiled with her broken teeth and bade me a warm hello. Don't worry, Beta. I've been around, but I'm going away soon. I need to go home. Home? I asked. Home to family? Home to family, yes, she smiled. I offered her my tiffin again, and she offered her plate once more, but something in me felt different. I felt a deep sense of loss as I looked at her, maybe wondering if this was the last time I would see her. Once again, I got up, kept the tiffin back in the pack, looked at her, and started cycling to school while waving her a goodbye. School went as usual, but her face kept popping up in my mind for some reason. Once it was time to leave, I stopped at the cycle shop to get my air filled and mentioned to the owner that I had finally met Aji after ages. Anna, I met Aji today after so long. Thank goodness she's still around. I was worried she'd moved to another place far away. Anna looked at me with wide set eyes. Are Aji who always sits there, you say? Han, yes. Who else, Anna? I met her today and she was telling me she's finally going back home, I guess to her village. OP, I didn't want to tell you because you were so attached to her, but she died during the monsoon due to her age and the relentless cold weather we had since some time. I looked at him in shock. I couldn't believe it. I told him I'd given her food just this morning. It can't be. I got astride my cycle and rushed to the spot. There was no sign of the food I'd given her, nor any telltale signs of a little wood fire being lit that very morning. I stood there frozen, and the next moment, with an onset of fear, speed cycled all the way back home. I was still a child back then, and the fact that her spirit had bade goodbye hit me a bit differently. I avoided that path for months, but soon started cycling on that route again once mollified. But some years later, when I thought back to that day, I realized what an honor it was to receive her last goodbye. And I still recall her smile and her humming songs whenever I pass by that spot. I have a lot of ghost stories to share, but this one is just something I still think about, a lot, even as an adult. I grew up in a ranch in Mexico. My family owned fields upon fields of corn, wheat, and avocado. I used to play in the cornfield because that was behind my nana's house. It was like a maze, which I loved to run around in. Well, one evening, I trailed off too deep, and I got lost. I was seven years old when this happened. As it got darker, I began to cry and roam aimlessly until I was grabbed by my arm. I screamed, but quickly realized that it was my nana's neighbor, Petra, also her BFF. In Spanish, she was my nana's comadre. A direct translation of the word is godmother. She baptized three of the 13 kids my nana had. In my family, a comadre or compadre is a nickname used as a term of endearment for the godparents of the kids they baptized. Well, my nana's comadre Petra found me and said, Mija, why are you out so late? You know stuff creeps at night. I told her I was lost, and she reprimanded me gently, but then told me that I was far away from my nana's house, and because it was cold, it would be best to go to her house. I held her hand, and she led me to her house. She asked if I was hungry, and I told her I was. She told me she had just made flour tortillas, and had beans cooking, and that it should be finished soon. I was happy because my favorite dish is tortillas and beans. We got to her house, and it was nice and warm. 
she sat me on her table and served me a huge bowl of beans and then cut me some fresh cheese. She made me some mini burritos which I happily ate and then told me she was going to call my nana that I was at her house. Again, nothing out of the ordinary. I felt fine, ate, and was extremely full. Then after, my nana's comadre came back from calling my nana. She sat across from me and smiled. She was a small woman, with very pretty hazel eyes, and said, Mija, I couldn't get a hold of my comadre or compadre. They must be looking for you, so finish up and wash up. I nodded. Also, you need to tell my comadre that I'm very sorry to have left without saying goodbye, she said as well. You're leaving, Nana Petra? I asked, feeling really sad. Yeah, but don't worry. I'll come back when the time's right. And she smiled at me. I was really sad. When are you leaving? When I drop you off, I'll leave with my daughter, she told me. I was sad, but I agreed to tell my Nana. Now that I'd finished eating, I washed my hands at her water pillar, and she led me back through the cornfield. She led me to the middle and kissed my hair and said, keep walking in a straight line. You'll hear your tata calling out for you. And remember to tell your nana what I said. I told her I would and began to walk in a straight line like how she'd pointed and I could hear my tata in the distance. I called back and we found one another in no time. He was upset. He thought a coyote found me and hurt me and he reprimanded me until we got to the house where my nana was sitting on the dining room table. I ran up to her and she asked me where I'd been. I told her that I'd been to Nana's Petra's house and she went pale. She asked me to clarify that and I told her that Nana Petra found me, fed me and brought me to the field when she hadn't been able to reach them on the phone. I told her that she wanted to say goodbye but that she had to leave with her daughter. At that very moment, my Nana began to cry, and I was scared because she was very distraught. My Tata told me to stop lying because my Nana was crying, and then I began to cry too. I swore it was all true. I told them what I saw and what I ate in detail. My Tata told me that it was impossible because Nana Petra had died that very morning. They also mentioned that Nana Petra didn't have any daughters, only sons. My Tata then called my uncle over, and they drove to Nana Petra's house, and I was never told anything after what they had found. Until I got older, my uncle told me that when they went to the house, they found the door open. The stove was hot, but the water pillar was empty, and the daughter mentioned we came to find out that my Nana Petra in her early 20s miscarried a baby girl, and she mourned her for a very long time. My uncle was spooked out, but they always say that my Nana Petra came to say goodbye to my Nana, but because I got lost, I sidetracked her. But nonetheless, it was spooky that she fed me, and I physically felt my Nana Petra. So I still have a hard time grasping the fact that it had been her spirit, and not her physical self. Okay, so this happened today, a Friday, 3rd of January 2020, at 4.36pm. I, a female and 20, was cooking with my sister, who is female and 16. She was boiling the pasta and eggs and I was making chef salad, meaning I was cutting the lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, and the cheeses and salami. When, because of time, I asked her to cut one of the cheeses, when it happened. I was cutting the salami while my sister was cutting the rigato cheese, when I felt a warm hand, the palm of the hand to be exact, slowly pushing me forward towards the table. The palm was at the left side, and the place underneath your shoulder, same level with your armpit. That hand slowly removed its palm from me, and the place was numb, tingling, and warm, but my entire body was instantly frozen. My sister and I didn't see anyone or anything, but she saw me 
how one minute I was joking about how the roles inside our household were reversed and that the kids did most of the chores while the adults were playing on their phones or sleeping and when I gasped and my body moved forward. Now, the first couple of seconds, my brain thought that it was our dad trying not to scare me by touching me because behind me is the terrace doors that led to a room that was supposed to be a balcony, but my grandparents closed it and turned it into the sunroom that then leads to another set of terrace doors that leads to the master bedroom. We turned the sunroom into my dad's den where he has his PC and his stuff for his hobby of building small army vehicles from plastic or wood when we moved in after grandma died. But the fact that our dad could be heard snoring and I felt the hand scared me. My sister didn't freak out as much but she got scared seeing me become white like snow from fear. When I explained to her what I felt, she told me that some days she feels the same thing especially at night. A warm hand on her back before she falls asleep. She told me that she thought it was only her tired mind playing tricks. Then I told her that many times I have felt shoves or someone touching while I do chores around the house. One time I was dancing and I felt a hand on my shoulder and turned to see if my dad or mom or my aunt or my sister who were in the house were trying to get my attention, but I saw nothing. One time, I felt it in my hair, like a stroke after I woke up from a nightmare. And two days ago, I was bolted awake, entire body jerked forward I mean, because of a nightmare that I can't recall, and I just knew that I was in danger when I felt the hand again stroking my hair. And when I turned around, I saw nothing, just the Christmas tree that I thought I had unplugged. When I looked at my phone, it was 9.45 a.m. So, I went and took my 10 a.m. pill for my Hashimoto thyroiditis, and then I fell back asleep. It's not the first time, but it was the first time it happened while I was with someone else in the room. I don't know if it's a friendly ghost of my grandparents or any other loved ones that we've lost and we have lost many in the past two decades. My best friend said that it might be muscle spasms, but why do they feel like a warm hand? Also, my sister complained a couple of months ago that she feels watched in her room at night and that is why she sleeps with the music on and covers her head. I told her that it must be grandma, since the room that my sister is in was grandma's favorite room. She used to pray in it and listen to church on the radio when she couldn't attend church. The house was built in 1978 and my grandparents sort of ordered it to be the way it is. And at 1983, my grandparents were the first residents. My house along with the rest of the apartments in the building was built in 1978 also. The area before it was built in was a river and farms according to my mom's knowledge. So what are your thoughts? Ghost or something else? This isn't a horrifying story, but it's a true and unforgettable, mysterious experience which happened to me about 20 years ago. It was a Saturday, and it was the middle of the night. For some reason, I really wanted to go for a drive. I'm not sure what came over me. I used to go on night drives all the time when I was younger, so I guess I must have been feeling nostalgic. It was past 2am, and I was sat alone in my car. I parked in a huge, empty car park and I was drinking some juice I bought from a nearby vending machine. It was at this point, another car pulled into the car park. 
The car park was empty, yet this car pulled right up next to mine. A woman got out and went to buy a drink from the vending machine. She stopped and looked my way. Even though it was dark, I could tell that she was pretty cute. A little younger than me too, I guessed. I thought myself pretty lucky. I called out to her straight away. Hey, what are you up to? What have you been doing tonight? From then on, the conversation kind of progressed to the point where I felt comfortable shooting my shot and inviting her for a ride in my car. I planned on driving her to some scenic spot and showing her the night views. I guess my motives weren't completely gentlemanly. If we clicked at that night viewing spot, then I would invite her to a hotel. I was getting carried away with my own fantasies on the drive. I barely noticed that she had begun to cry. I pulled over and asked her what was wrong. She told me that she had gone driving that night with the intention of taking her own life. She told me that there were so many reasons, but wouldn't go into great detail about them. Naturally, I abandoned my desires and focused on comforting her. I tried to remind her of the joy in life. I told her that she was beautiful, and it would be a total waste. And doing what she intended to do didn't resolve anything, it just created more sadness. Now I'm older, I think I could have done a better job. I'm telling you this story as honestly as I can. And when she was crying in my car and talking about all of that, it freaked me out. After a while, she composed herself and thanked me. She said that she would do her best going forward, and we headed back to the car park. On the drive back, the atmosphere in the car was as heavy as lead. I tried to tell her funny anecdotes about me and my friends and my family, you know, to get her spirits up and think about the positives in life. And I saw her smile. We got back to the car and I told her to really think about things and I shook her hand. I remember her hand being particularly cold. Well, it was an odd night. I had a lot to consider on the drive home. There were no other cars on the road but mine. It took about an hour to get home, and I went straight to bed. In the morning I went downstairs and noticed a black envelope sticking out of my door. There was no address written on the front of it. I didn't like the look of it, but I opened it. Thanks for tonight. The view was beautiful, and I had fun with you. No way. It was from her. I didn't even tell her my address, so I ran outside to see if I could spot her car, but it wasn't nearby. I was a bit freaked out by it tossed the letter in the trash and went about my day. Later that day, I went and fished the letter out of the trash again. We definitely didn't mention where we lived. I dumped it back in the trash and took the garbage outside on my way to go food shopping. I was gone for a couple of hours, and by the time I came back, I noticed that there was another black envelope in my mail slot. I began to tremble. Should I just throw it away or open it? I asked myself. I couldn't decide straight away. In the end, curiosity got the better of me, and I opened it. There were only a few words written on the letter this time. Don't throw my letter away. I was really freaked out. Did I now have a stalker? What did all this mean? I didn't know what to do. I ended up calling a friend. I needed someone to talk to. I told them the whole story, and they wanted to see the letter. Well, my friend didn't really help much. He just kept saying he didn't understand her either. He told me not to throw the letter away. I was scared if I did, I would get more letters, so I agreed with him. I ended up tucking that letter away in a cardboard box with some forgettable things like old gas bills and electric bills. I shoved that box to the back of my closet and ended up forgetting about it. I saw that black envelope again a few years later when I was moving out. The fear that surrounded that letter and that woman had long subsided, so I decided to take the letter with me to the new house. If nothing else, it's a talking point, right? It went to the back of a new closet in the new house, and it was sealed away there again for some time. So I guess you're asking what the point of this story is, right? Well, the director of my company embezzled a huge amount of money, and then suddenly disappeared, leaving in his wake a huge amount of loan debt. That treacherous director was the one I spoke to about the black envelope. We were good friends, well, that's what I thought, until I found that he had signed my name as his sponsor against all of this insurmountable debt. Oh, it wasn't just corporate debt, he had borrowed from loan sharks as well. 
Collection agents came to our company looking for me on a regular basis. And this got out to our customers, and it caused us to lose employees. Customers told other customers, rival companies found out about the debt, and our name was Mud. Ten years of hard work had come crashing down all around me. I lost the company that I had helped build, and all that remained was the mountains of debt attached to my name. I hated everything in life, and I saw no point going forward. I would often go on night drives with my dark thoughts, and one night I came to a decision. I didn't want to go on any longer. I got home and I saw something. There was a black envelope sticking out of my mail slot. Memories of that night, long ago, came rushing back to me. There was no fear, just a sense of understanding. Without hesitation, I opened the letter. I want to remind you of the joy of life. You are beautiful, and it would be a total waste. Doing what you intend to do isn't going to resolve anything except create more sadness. I was completely overwhelmed. I broke down and I cried. Tears flowed and flowed. She had remembered the exact words I had said to her. That letter is my prized possession. I live in poverty these days, but with positivity. I don't know who she is, or where she is, or even if she's real or some spirit guide, but I owe a lot to her, and I just hope this story helps whoever needed to hear it. I had posted this in a different forum, oh, maybe a year ago. But since I just discovered this subreddit today, I'm going to share it again. For my first birthday, many moons ago, my parents surprised me with a kitten. That kitten went through everything with me. Countless dance recitals, many nights of terrible instrument practicing, high school graduation, etc. She even slept on my bed most nights. She passed away two days after I turned 18. I didn't lose a pet that day. I lost a sibling, a best friend, and it was crushing. About three days after she passed, I was laying down trying to sleep when suddenly I heard her meow. My kitty had a very distinct, nasally meow, so I knew it was her. Of course, I jolt up. Why am I hearing my dead cat meowing? So as I'm looking around the room, I hear it again next to my window. I heard it one more time, and then silence. Just deafening silence. I don't even remember hearing the crickets outside. I brought it up to my mom a few months later, and she told me, I bet you she just stopped by one last time to say goodbye. It made me feel so nice to think that she cared enough to make an extra stop on her way to the litter box in the sky. Okay, so, for some context, my dad passed away at the very end of January this year. I suspect it was from an accidental overdose because of his substance abuse issues, but no one in the family wanted to look further into it, so we never got a further autopsy. I think his autopsy note said something like a heart attack. He usually texted and called me daily and saw me weekly. But after him not texting me for a few days, I got worried and I called the police to do a welfare check. An hour later, they called back with the news. Unfortunately, he is deceased. Those words run through my head now, all the time. I had deep regrets when he passed. He was always a hypochondriac, and also just coming up with excuses and minor problems that only I could be able to fix, i.e. the Netflix was broken. He usually just didn't know how to restart the PS3 when the app crashed. Or my rabbit, who he cared for, was sick. So when he texted me at odd hours, a couple of days before I called the police, saying that my rabbit wasn't eating. I didn't take him very seriously. I'd met him for lunch a day before he stopped responding, and he was very shaky, and said he wasn't feeling well. 
but he said that weakly, so I figured I had no reason to worry. It's been the same story for years. Well, I was wrong. Once I got that phone call back saying he was gone, my world stopped. For the past several months, I've been fairly in denial. I went through his belongings after it happened, but my family wasn't interested in helping and we ultimately ended up hiring a lady to do an estate sale for us. I grabbed what I could think to hold on to, and I ended up with a lot of stuff in boxes that I hadn't looked through too well. This will be relevant later. A few weeks ago, I had a dream. I haven't dreamed of him since he passed. When it first happened, I wished to see him, just one last time. But as time went on, I began to give up on seeing his ghost or presence one last time. That idea fully faded away, so I'm forever grateful for this experience I was given weeks ago. I dreamed that I was in a house I didn't recognize. It was clearly very old. My dad was born in 1947, if that holds any relevance to this house being so old. I walked up to a kitchen island and sat at a bar stool, which is when I see my dad, easily 20 years younger, walk out of a room opposite from me. A small brown and white dog that I'd never seen before comes out with him. I remember not being able to identify the breed, but the characteristics of the dog burned into my memory. Black nose, fluffy, brown with white blonde patches, and very small. He followed the dog, walking towards me. I forget how the conversation started, but I know I began crying rather quickly. He looked so good. He was wearing a long sleeve blue pattern dress shirt he used to wear a long time ago. I cried, and he asked me, What's wrong, kiddo? I'm better now. Don't you believe me? And I responded with, I do believe you. You look happier and healthier. That's why I'm crying. He told me not to worry. He would be okay. And so would I. And then, he said goodbye. Left the front door. And I woke up sobbing. It was a good bit of closure for me. And I've hung on to it since it happened. I figured my mind was creating that memory for me. To cheer me up. And provide me with that closure. But two days ago, I started sorting through some stuff that's been in boxes for several months, and I came across a folder I don't remember. It was full of old pictures, his old girlfriends in the 60s and 70s, cars and stuff. I didn't remember grabbing it, but it was a nice bit of memories to hold on to. One picture stood out though. It made me genuinely lose my breath and tear up when I saw it. That exact same little dog from that dream who I'd never seen in my life. A photograph that was decades old. I texted my aunt and she confirmed that that was one of his favourite little dogs. I forget what she said his or her name was. I didn't even tell her what happened. I described the dog and she told me how much he loved that dog without skipping a beat. I like to believe it really was my dad in that dream. He had the strength to come back and bring one of his favourite pups along with him because he was a huge animal lover and I wouldn't expect it any other way. I don't know what I believe happens to us when everything is over, but I believe wherever he is, He is happy, and I am forever thankful for that.
This is my favorite story. When I first moved to Orlando, I got a job at a local company and needed to find a place to live. At the time, I was renting a room from a nice older couple. However, I was also getting married so I needed to find a place for both of us to live. Those that live in Orlando know how expensive it can be and I'm not much of an apartment guy. So, finally we found this nice little house. And when I say little, <laughs> I mean little. Anyway, the landlord gave us a great deal cause he didn't want to really spend any time fixing it up, cause it wasn't worth it. After all, it was really small and really old. They had just moved his wife's mother to an elderly home and he did fix the electrical and plumbing. I agreed that I would paint and fix things up so long as the basics worked. He was a really nice landlord and we got along great. A few weeks after we moved in, the wife came by and let us know they would be away for a bit. Turns out her mom passed away a few days ago and they were taking her back to the old country. I felt bad. I didn't know she was that sick and we moved into her house. After that, nothing seemed out of the ordinary but the air about the house changed a little. Or at least I thought. Anyway, shortly later I got married and we settled into our daily lives. Well, I was working on the front porch when I found a small brooch under one of the rotten boards. It was pretty nice and brought it inside and placed it on the mantel. I figured I would give it to the landlord the next time I see him, cause it was most likely either Lillian's or his wife's. That was when things started to get weird. The first thing I started noticing or more to the point my wife noticed and blamed me, was that the keepsakes from our wedding, champagne glasses, knives, photos, etc., got moved around and were not where she left them. I said I had nothing to do with them moving, but her being her wasn't having any of it. So, we moved them back. A few days later, we came home from dinner and there they were, rearranged, again. So... I looked over at her and asked her how I did it this time. The brooch was still in the same place on the mantel but everything else had been moved around. That would happen a few more times until my now wife got over it and left them where they got moved to. One day I was dusting. Yeah, I know, a guy that dusts. Hey, <laughs> I had to do something to stay on her good side. And came across the brooch on the mantel. As I looked at it, a breeze went by. It was just the fan. But that got me thinking about the odd things that have been happening. I started to think that maybe the events were Lillian's doing. I asked my wife what she thought and she said that I was crazy. She is right, I am, but not the point though. That the ghost of the old lady that lived here was haunting the house and moving the wedding stuff around. Well, yeah, I said. She gave me that look and walked away. Anyway, the following weekend the landlord came by to mow the lawn and I went outside to give the brooch thinking that wouldn't change anything. His wife was in the truck reading a book and I walked over and handed her the brooch. Well, she turned about ten shades of white and looked up at me and asked where I found it. I told her that I found it under the porch when I was fixing the floor. She said that this was her mother's and that she had lost it when she was a kid and her mother was very mad at her for playing with it and losing it. She smiled and the color returned to her face and hugged me and then I walked back to the house. As I walked up to the front, I looked at the house and noticed that in the front window there was a shadow behind the lace curtains and it looked like maybe a person. As I walked closer, I tripped over a rock, and when I looked back up, it wasn't there. I went into the house and looked around, and didn't see anything, so I moved on. A few days later, I get home, and my wife starts rambling on about, Do I smell the flowers? And she thinks we have mice or rats, cause she keeps hearing movement. I say no, and I poke her a bit and say, does it sound like little feet or footsteps? She looks at me, 
and then says, Footsteps. After that, the events get more frequent and interesting. I'd be sitting on the couch, and I would see out of the corner of my eye, movement or a change of light, not quite a shadow, but almost going from the kitchen to the bathroom, which is a straight shot and there isn't any way light can move that way back there. There were other things like strange sounds of things moving in the kitchen or the back bedroom. A lot of footsteps. The whole house is hardwood floors, it really carried. Little things like that. We never got touched or nothing bad ever happened to either of us. I decided that Lillian was still here after the brooch event. Maybe she was happy that I gave it back to her daughter, but it was still her house, so... I figured she was well within her right to live here too. And besides, I love the way she messed with my wife. She is so easy. It even got to the point where sometimes I talked to Lillian. Never got a response back, and that was before cell phones or voice recorders were as high tech as they are now. I'm not sure who she messed with more, <laughs> me or my wife. We stayed in that house for six years and had two kids in that house before we moved to another city. Shortly after we moved, the landlord called and asked if anything strange had happened to us while we were in the house. I told him that his mother-in-law was still around and that she was super cool. He then said that's what he thought because they were in there repainting and running ceiling fans and they both had run-ins with something strange. I told him that she was good to us and that we missed living there. I hung up the phone and that was the last time I ever heard from him. I found out a few years later from some friends that the house was torn down and a new house had been put up in its place, way bigger than the original. I was a bit sad, but then I thought that Lillian might not like that very much and that I hope she rearranges everything in the new house and drives the new owners crazy, <laughs> like it's in my wife. This experience happened in May of 1979, when I was 15 years old. My maternal grandmother had passed, maybe a week or two before this event. I always loved going to her house as a child and spending the night. She was a wonderful grandma. She had moved to California after her last husband died in 1976, so I didn't get to see her for the last three years of her life. I was a freshman in high school, and in English class we were reading Romeo and Juliet. I had stayed up late that night while my parents slept to watch Romeo and Juliet on a local PBS station, so I was the only one awake at the time. I was laying on the floor of the living room with my pillow and blanket, with only the television on. A little explanation of how our house was laid out. The living room was in the front of the house, with the dining room and kitchen directly behind the living room. The area between the living room and dining room is completely open, while the kitchen area is blocked from the living room. By the wall for the stairs that go into the basement, you could walk from the living room into the dining room, to the kitchen, into the front hallway, which brings you back into the living room. Between the kitchen and the front hallway are the basement stairs, and if you go the other direction, it's a hallway to the three bedrooms and the bathroom. On with the story. I was on the floor with a pillow and blanket watching the TV when I heard the sound of flip-flop shoes come from the kitchen into the dining room and right up behind my dad's reclining chair that was maybe three feet behind me. Now, my grandma always wore flip-flops in the summer. It was a sound that I associated with her. I've always loved the paranormal and accepted it as part of life. My mom had told me things that happened to her as a child and an adult ever since I was little, but when I heard the flip-flops, I was basically frozen in fear. I called out in a small voice, Mom? Even though I knew it was not her, no answer. I knew she was sleeping and never wore those types of shoes or even owned a pair of them. I can't even remember if I was brave enough to look behind the chair I grabbed up my pillow and blanket, turned off the TV, and ran like a frightened rabbit. I'm not sure how I navigated the first corner. It was completely dark in the house, 
but when I made the second turn to go into the hallway, to the safety of my room, I miscalculated the turn and ran directly into the wall. Luckily, I had my blanket draped over my arm, otherwise I might have broken it. When I hit the wall, all my mind could think was that I ran into a person, most likely the ghost of my grandma. I was struck with crazy terror before I figured out it was just the wall and that I had made the turn too soon. In the safety of my room, lights on, door locked, and under my blanket, I slowly calmed myself down. I don't remember for sure, but I think I slept with the lights on that night. I told my mom about it the next morning. She asked me why I was so scared, and made me realize that my grandma would never hurt me, and that maybe she just wanted to see me one last time, and say goodbye. That was so true, she wouldn't have hurt me, and as I've thought about it over the years, it's really very sweet that she came to me that night. There's no way that anyone will ever convince me that this didn't happen. I was 100% awake at that time, and it was most certainly my grandma. Years later, when my first child, my daughter, was two, she came to me again, and that time I really believed she saved my life. I'll save that story for another time. My mom has a million stories, some of them involving supernatural stuff. But this particular one, I was reminded of when I read a similar story. My mom was about 15 and had a younger friend that she would look out for and keep company, two or three years younger. She also worked in a donut shop. Her friend had an older sister, we'll call her Emily. She was 18 and also a friend of my mom's. Emily appreciated that my mom looked out for her little sister at school, since she was busy with senior year. Emily was apparently a total knockout, like the prettiest girl in town, easily. She also had a heart of gold. My mom stressed repeatedly how sweet this girl was. Well, she had just graduated high school and gotten a modeling gig. She was about to start a career and launch right into life, from a small rural town. Apparently, right before she was supposed to leave town, she came to visit my mom to say goodbye. She'd popped into the donut shop one morning to tell my mom goodbye, thank you for everything, and to keep an eye on her little sister. My mom found out later that Emily had died in a car accident the night before she came to visit. She is and will always be convinced that Emily appeared to her to make sure that her little sister would be taken care of after she was gone. Her sister apparently was never the same after this happened, of course. It really rocked this small town. Anyway, it was a short one. I swear it's true, or at least my mom swears it's true. And I believe her. I was born when my parents were both 42. I am the only child they shared, although they had both had previous marriages and bore two children each. I am personally of the opinion that this is a little late in life to be having a baby. When I was about 7, some classmates and I were discussing the ages of our parents. When it was my turn, one girl exclaimed, What? They're gonna die when you're like 10. I thought this was pretty rude, but wasn't too bothered by it. Later that year, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, and after three years of suffering, she passed away due to complications, which is a whole hospital horror story. I went back to school a week or so later. That girl approached me and said, when I heard about your mum, I cried. My sister said, why are you crying? You didn't even know her. I recalled the now painful prediction she had made, and could see that she didn't consciously remember, but a part of her did. So I had to grow up without my mother. It caused me to come to terms with my own mortality and see the circle of life turning. I moved about 700 kilometers away from where I grew up, had five children and built myself a life that is very close to nature. 
My father was challenged by all this. He was always telling me that I was worrying him and giving him grey hair. I ended up giving him a copy of the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. This really changed him. Like me, Christianity did not really vibe with him. But I swear, reading that book took him closer to enlightenment. After that, he seemed to relate to me a lot better. Most school holidays, I would take the kids to stay with dad and his wife. He remarried his first wife. It was so nice to be able to spend time with him like that. His wife mostly seemed put out by my presence. It destroyed the delusion she liked to have that she never left him and had a whole other life while dad and mum were together. So I was a bit of an inconvenience in that way. I decided to give them some space for a couple of years. By the time we visited again, things had changed. As in, Dad had gone downhill. His posture was the most obvious. He had gone from being so straight that he had corners. My favourite description of his personality also suited his posture. To having slouched shoulders, stooped neck and holding his hands up as he walked. When I saw this, my brain went and said, Damn, you look like you hit your use by date. I really hate how right that was. It took the doctor 12 months to figure out what was happening. One symptom that alarmed me was difficulty swallowing and sometimes choking on his food. That turned out to be a huge indicator. He had motor neuron disease. If not medicated early enough, a patient will only live for two years. He passed away about two years ago. So that left me with no parents. All of a sudden, there was no higher safe place for me to go. No protection. I felt exposed to the universe, like the pinnacle of a pyramid. I was now the only protection in my lineage for my children. I am responsible for everyone. This began to weigh heavily on me. About a year after my father's death, I fell into a depression. I lost my happy-go-luckies. The way I just wake up with the sun and my base emotion is happy. I really didn't want to do anything. I began to sleep. A lot. Have you ever overslept? Like, say, a few hours? You probably find it difficult to go to sleep that night. Well, that wasn't happening with me. I could sleep and sleep and sleep. I knew it wasn't normal. It began to astound me. Honestly, I would spend about four hours awake. This began to annoy my family, but they didn't hassle me too much. They recognized that I was going through something. I don't dream often, so when I had this dream I took notice. I was at my dad's place cooking corned beef. My stepmother came into the kitchen and started talking to me. I was then surprised to see dad. The circumstances were that after the corned beef was done, I would be on my way to somewhere else. There was this business and pressure to the situation. He was just catching up with me before we both had to be on our own ways. This was comforting and nice, but I didn't really think much of it. About two weeks later, there was another dream. This time we were meeting for lunch. Again, while I was on my way to another destination. It was a happy reunion. We would meet up for lunch like this when he was alive. Me and the kids, him and his wife. It was so lovely. And in the end, we all went to do our own things. Not long after that, my motivation slowly returned. Some level of happiness crept back to me. I got up. I did some chores picked up my crafts again and I look back on those dreams with misty eyes and I think thank you dad you haven't abandoned me you still care I feel like the message of those dreams is yes my daughter I have gone but the earth still turns the sun still shines your children are growing and your life can't wait for you go on and live I lost my mother when I was 10 and my dad when I was nearly 40. I can say that 
when you have good people in your life, they are never alive long enough. Love you so much, Mum and Dad. Thanks for everything. And may we meet again someday. I want to keep this short as it's very personal. My husband died when he was quite young. We both knew that it was coming as he had developed a serious illness a few years back. His illness meant that he had lost his ability to drive. At the time he lost his license, I didn't have one myself. I knew that driving was a big part of his life and he loved it. So I applied for my license and everything was going well. I passed the practical test, but I failed the written test. I'm such a dumbass. It broke my heart that I failed because I wanted to do so much for him. I was so disappointed on the day I got those test results. I wanted to pass so badly. I wanted to help, and I felt so stupid. I thought he would be just as disappointed as I was, but he wasn't. He comforted me. He was such a great husband. Come on, don't be down. You were so close last time. Listen, imagine I am right behind you. I know you can do it. I took the second test and I failed again. I cannot tell you how disappointed I was. Maybe I was feeling the pressure of what it meant, or I had too much going on, but I know that these are nothing but excuses. Eventually, his condition worsened, and unfortunately, he passed away. I guess that I didn't need to take that test anymore, but I felt like I should. I felt like I should try, like there was someone cheering me on. So test day arrived again. As usual, I rode my bike to the test center. The bike I had had these funky mirrors attached to the handlebars. I realize now that I had become a very cautious person. Safety was really important to me back then. I guess you understand why. I checked the mirrors regularly. There was no one behind me as I rode down the street. I then took another look in the mirror, and suddenly there was someone stood in the road behind me. It looked like they were waving. Was that you? Were you right behind me like you promised? I passed the test, by the way. I remember that it was a sunny day. I rode my bike to the place I met my husband and stayed there for a long time. I'm so grateful for everything. Thank you. I grew up on a small farm in south central Pennsylvania. Our house was built in the mid to late 1800s and had several occupants before my parents moved in, one of which we believed stuck around after death. We called this entity Joe after a farmer that lived there that was killed in an accident not far from the house. Both my family and several friends had seen Joe around the property. Joe would appear in a window of the old barn before the barn was destroyed. He would also make his presence known around the house, moving things, whispering, and occasionally manifesting himself for people to see. He appeared for a group of people that we had visiting in the early 90s, this faculty from a boarding school my mother taught at. Several of the teachers asked who the old man standing on our second floor balcony was. They all thought he was a new teacher at the school, but when they asked my mum and went to show her the man, he was gone. My first time seeing Joe was in the early 90s, I had heard him and seen things moving on their own since I was a kid, but never actually saw him before. This was when I was in high school, maybe grade 9 or 10, I was homesick for the day. My parents were both at work and my brother was off at college. We lived at a crossroad in a two-story house on five acres of land. At the time we had a small barn with a large pasture for several sheep and goats. The windows of my second floor bedroom overlooked the barn and the pasture to the north and the crossroad to the west. Anyway, at one point in the early afternoon, a noise caught my attention and I peeked out the window to see what it was. The animals had somehow opened one of the gates and escaped the pasture. 
I groaned and got dressed to get them back in the fenced area. I was sick and did not want to deal with this. Before leaving my room, I looked out the window again, and to my surprise, saw a man herding the animals back into the pasture and latching the gate. He was older, maybe in his 60s or 70s, wearing glasses, black pants, and suspenders with a white button-down shirt. When he was done, he turned to look directly at my window, smiled and waved, and started walking toward the road. I watched him walk off in disbelief. When I couldn't see him anymore from that window, I went to the other window to see where he was going. He had disappeared. There was no sign of him walking down the road, and there was no vehicle that he could have arrived in. There was also no time for him to have gotten into a vehicle and driven off. He was just gone. I haven't seen Joe since then, but my parents still live there today, and report that he's still around, making his presence known with whispering and playful moving of objects. During the summer, I lost my grand-aunt, Helena, and she was my maternal grandmother's sister. My grandma came from Aegeo, in the region of Poleponesus, in Greece, where we visited the family tombstone and paid our respects to the last departing grandparent. The cemetery is so beautiful and well taken care of, and it was just pure peace. The cemetery was public-owned, which surprised me because in Greece, cemeteries aren't that well taken care of, or at least those I have visited in the past. It was quite frankly a shock, and it was so big it stretched over a small hill going at least three miles long if you walked around it. The earliest grave there was from 1816 as well, which also shocked me. I felt so calm there, like when you enter a library. It was super hot the entire day, and in the cemetery, there was a perfect cool breeze, and yet I felt so warm and content. I felt at peace. However, when I visited my paternal grandma's grave specifically, I felt this chill and had a vibe of unrest. That cemetery was cold and angry where my maternal grandpa and grandma were buried, the one I visited as a kid. And it has this restless calm. But this cemetery in Aegeo was a completely different experience. I'm still in disbelief as to what I experienced there. I felt like I was being hugged by all my ancestors, and that I was being welcomed. I actually felt a warm glow, and I didn't want to leave. I looked at the family grave, and I said a soft hi, and a nice to meet you in a low voice, so my parents wouldn't think I was crazy. The moment I said it though, I felt this warm hand on my shoulders and I felt like crying. I'm even blinking tears away whilst typing this, and I did the same then too. Now I've never met my grandfathers, and I never met my grand uncles or grand aunts old enough to be able to have a conversation with. I was five or six years old when I last saw any of them, and I was ten when the last grand uncle died. I wasn't able to go to the funeral and my paternal grandmother died before I could say goodbye, and so did my maternal grandma. My grandfathers died before I could meet them also, and it used to make me sad. I wondered why and how things would have been otherwise, and I had years of having dreams of being with them in my great-grandpa's shop, my aunt's house, or it would be an old Athenian coffee shop from the 1950s. I felt lighter and happier leaving, although I didn't want to and it was like I'd made peace with how things were, and I knew that they knew I existed, and that I loved them even though I'd never met them. They knew that things were complicated with the other family members, and that they didn't hate me because I was related to them or was the offspring of them. This was the most peaceful experience I have ever had in a cemetery, and I wanted to share it with you all. I was eight years old when my grandpa died. He had had a heart attack and passed on Easter Sunday morning that year. It was extremely hard on all of us because he was pretty young, late 50s, and it was fairly preventable. He was addicted to smoking cigarettes and it caused him to have a lot of issues with his heart. This stressed my mum out and made her smoke even more. 
She was 31, but had been smoking since she was a teenager. She had a heart attack less than two months after his death. I understand that her age might make it hard to believe, but she really did have a serious heart attack at that age. I only mention my mum's health here because it's important to why I'm not home during this story. My sister and I stayed at my grandma's apartment while my mum was in the hospital. My dad wanted to be with her for obvious reasons, and my uncle, my mum's brother, drove up so that he could be close by in case things got worse. We all slept over at my grandma's. My sister, six, my cousin, six, slept with my grandma in her bed. My uncle was still at the hospital with my dad, so I slept with my aunt in the living room. I was in the recliner and she took the couch. The recliner faced a very narrow hallway on the right side of the living room. There weren't any windows that could shine lights from outside in. My aunt went to the bathroom at the end of the hallway and my grandma was with my sister and cousin in her room, so I was alone watching Three's company in the living room. I happened to look down the hallway. On the end of the right side of the hall was my grandpa's old room. They slept in different rooms because he had a very loud CPAP machine. I swear on everything that he was there, walking down the hallway. I could only see him from his shoulders up, but I know that it was him. There wasn't any other light that could reach that angle. No cars passing could have shone their light up that high and all the way to the back. The only window nearby was all the way to the left of the living room. I wasn't scared of him, but I was startled by seeing something coming at me so unexpectedly. So little me screamed my head off and he disappeared. Grandma came rushing out of her room to see what had happened. I honestly don't remember if I told her that I saw him. I don't remember much of my night after that. I'd feel awful if I scared him away from me. My mum woke up from her surgery before my dad or anyone else was in the room with her. She says the first thing she remembers is my grandpa holding her hand and telling her it was all going to be okay. She went back to sleep. When she woke back up, she wrote down the word dad, followed by a question mark. She still had the tubes down her throat so she couldn't actually speak. She wanted to see him. My father looked to the paper and had to remind her that he wasn't with us anymore. She just broke down into tears. I didn't know about this incident until earlier this year, and I never talk about the night I saw him walking down the hallway of his old apartment. I think he just wanted to check in on all of us to make sure that we were okay. I just wanted to ramble about this because it still makes me sad and I miss him very much. It's hard to format this into a true story mode because it does make me emotional, but I hope I did well enough. The anniversary of his death was a few weeks ago, and this time of year always makes me think of this incident. My mum's heart attack will have happened 15 years ago this June. Maybe it was just an emotionally stressful time, or maybe we're both crazy, but I like to believe in my eight-year-old brain. I like to think that it was real, and not a child's hyperactive imagination. I like believing in my mum's experience with seeing him there so clearly holding her hand. He was the type to do that. It's a bit wild that the times we both saw him, we were so close to each other, but I guess that might make sense too if he had a chance to come visit us one last time. My maternal grandparents lived in Nebo, Missouri, a little community in the Mark Twain National Forest. We lived in Springfield, making for a couple hours trip when we'd visit for holidays. Thanksgiving, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day, even the 4th of July sometimes. And sometimes they'd have one of us kids visit for a few days. In 2006, my grandmother had a stroke and had to be put in a facility to monitor her state. Her mental state never recovered, and the last photos of her I saw were nearly unrecognizable. All of us were preparing ourselves for the inevitable, 
that we'd have to say goodbye for the last time. Then, one Sunday morning, my father answered a phone call, and shortly after, the younger of my two sisters started crying. When we asked what the problem was, she said, Grandpa died. His health had broken down, and despite the attempt to get him medical attention, he'd gone quickly. That Wednesday, we had the funeral and burial. Given her physical and mental state, Grandma couldn't be there. In a couple days, we got the news that Grandma had died peacefully, and we had a second funeral and burial about a week after her husband. Now for the ghostly part. At the family meetings and such after the second funeral, a little story got out. Grandma had been informed that her husband had died, but on hearing this news, she protested that couldn't be, as he was still visiting her. Now, as I said, after the stroke, Grandma's mental state wasn't quite all there, but what if she was right? What if my grandfather was still visiting her? Did he not want to go without her? During my first 20 years, I never questioned that they loved each other. Maybe that love was enough to keep them together, even after one of them had already died. So this didn't happen to me, but my close friend's little cousin, let's call her Angie. She was five years old at the time, and I remember hearing about how her mum used to have encounters with the paranormal often. But as she got older, she shut them out. So I guess these talents were passed on to her daughter. One day, Angie was playing while her uncle Ben was watching her. He asked her who she was playing with and she said it was her imaginary friend. Not unusual for kids to have imaginary friends, so Ben didn't think much of it. What Angie didn't know is that many years ago when Ben was a child, he had a friend named Corey. Ben and Corey were having a play date, and Corey borrowed a pair of Ben's shoes. When Corey went home, he was still wearing Ben's shoes, and he died in a car crash. Ben decided to leave the shoes on and bury Corey in them, out of respect. Little Angie had never been told this information, as she was only five years old. This is the chilling part. She continues to talk to her imaginary friend, and Ben is engaging with her, until Angie stops, looks at Ben, and says, His name is Corey. He says he's sorry he still has your shoes. And this is not the only time I've heard of stories like this from my friend, the cousin of Angie. Angie is now probably 13 or so, and I wonder if she still has these abilities. Either way, every time I hear this story, it never fails to send chills down my spine. Hello watchers and listeners. Thank you so much for watching, and Merry Christmas. So I thought I'd do wholesome ghost stories again this year, like I did last Christmas. The reason being, I think it's nice to realize not everything is terrifying all the time. And I hope that these stories help you appreciate what and who you have at the present moment. A huge thank you to all my fellow narrators and friends in the horror community who gave up their time to help me out with this one. I understand this is a busy time of year and I really do appreciate everyone's effort. And also a huge thank you to all the Reddit users who kindly allowed me to use their stories. And not to forget, stories 1, 11 and 12 which were not from Reddit. Stories 1 and 12 were translated by Jay Nightmares and he let me use them on my channel. Story 11 was submitted by subscriber Marisa Dima. So once again, thank you. If you'd like to help support this channel, there are links to both my Patreon and Teespring account in the description below, so feel free to have a look if you're interested. And as always, the biggest thank you to all of you for your continued support. I truly do appreciate it. And remember, Papa loves you. <laughs>
Ha, 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 ha.